So good morning. Welcome to our COP for December. And um, go ahead in the chat and, and um, I want you to answer how was your so just say your how was your assessment and instruction blueprint coming along? And that was the deliverable from session two of School Support Institute. Or you can say what are some key takeaways you have from this process. And if you don't have it yet, then just uh, put it on your calendar between now and the end of January that you have to get that done and ask any questions you might have about that. I'll give y'all a second to respond or to think. Good. And if you're having trouble kind of just jogging your memory, this was a little plan that you were putting together. We started the conversation in session one of School Support Institute with assessment. It carried over into session two where we started talking about um, like core instruction and what happens in there. So this is a little blueprint that you're coming up with that just talks about what assessments do you really need, um, which is going to actually be very applicable to today's session for our COP. And then what instruction do you have to meet the needs of that? And then what outside of core instruction do you need to meet the needs of whatever those assessment pieces are. Uh, last time in School Support Institute, we talked about back testing and figuring out exactly where those gaps um, exist for students so that we can really get them what they need where they're at. Good. I know we have all, you have 10 billion and 52 things happen in yellow brains. So I figured that was just a little reminder in case we didn't get there yet. Okay, so our objective today is that you're going to identify data sources that can be used to track the progress of your innovation. And so we have some um, heavy things happening with the grant. We are coming to the next year will be the close of cohort one, which cohort one is you initially got some funding for some schools um, that says that they're going to do an innovation to see if we can improve um, literacy outcomes for our students. And then cohort two we'll start next year with the last funding of cohort one, last year of funding for cohort one happening and the first year of cohort two funding happening at the same time. So what I have to do over the course of January and February is look to see what's the health of the innovations happening. Can we justify extending this to cohort two? So I thought that this would be a great topic for our COP this month so that we can really make sure we're being intentional. We have data that we can look at to track um, the progress of our innovations and make any adjustments we need to make between now and then because I want everybody to keep getting funding and I want to keep funding other things across. We have a lot of money in this grant. So um, that's the intention. So we talked about our objective. We're going to talk about data sources um, and what might be more applicable to different innovations. We have all three of the different innovations that are happening. Uh, frequency of data checks and next steps. And then we're going to do some collaboration and some closure. All right, so let's start with a little brainstorm. In the chat, enter what data sources you currently use to check the effectiveness of your innovation, but don't press enter yet. I'll tell you when to hit enter. Don't press enter yet. What data sources are you currently using to check to see if your innovation is effective? All right, go ahead and click enter. It's pretty inclusive, Jordan, good. Feedback and surveys, it's definitely something some people don't consider. That's great, Miss Antoinette. So y'all definitely have some of the pieces that we should be considering for sure. And hopefully today you can kind of look to see what data you're using. Do I have enough data 
or do I need more or do I have too much? Sometimes that's a thing. Sometimes we're over testing. We're not using that data to make informed decisions about something. And maybe there's something that can come off of the plate too. All right, so here are some different, you mentioned some of these, here are some different data sources. So you can do pre and post tests that measure the skill you are pre-teaching or the strategy from your family engagement session. You can give a little assessment and say, here's where their skill level was before, here's your skill level after, um, this is how much they grew, this is how impactful this piece of the innovation was. You can also definitely look at those formative and summative assessments that are happening in class. Um, specifically, if you're doing the pre-teaching innovation, and even the family literacy engagement. If you look to see, okay, we've been working on this skill, we're pre-teaching on this skill and their formative assessment scores are growing, I know it's working. If maybe they're not growing or they're not growing at the rate that I want them to, maybe we come back and we discuss some next steps for that. Literacy assessments from any of the intervention programs that you're using, and y'all mentioned some of those, you know, your Dibbles, uh, your Spire, uh, any of those things. Progress monitoring data surveys um, from stakeholders involved in the innovation. And those stakeholders guides could be the actual students. They could be teachers, they could be parents, they could be faculty and staff, they could be your QOZ partner, you know, any of the community, any of those people. And then also walk through observation and feedback um, of the innovation in action. So if the, when, when the innovation is occurring, if you're doing some walkthroughs and providing some feedback, that's another good data source there too, that, that observation data. So are there any that are not on here that you use? You can either unmute or post it in the chat. Are there any that you're using that are not on here? And then secondarily, what might be better for your innovation? Because some of these are gonna be better for different innovations. Like Christy, I know y'all are uh, case management. So what of these ones might be better for case management? We use, um, I do the progress monitoring. We definitely do that. Um, again, I, I, the teachers use the formative and summative assessments for, for sure. Mm -hmm. Pre-tests and post-tests are definitely uh, part of uh, probably everybody's um, activities. Uh, I don't do surveys. Yeah, I have not done surveys. Yeah, and y'all don't um, have to use all of these guys. These are just like thinking about what applies most to your innovation and how are you using these to make decisions about your innovation? We do, probably my most used one would be the progress monitoring for me personally. Okay, um, and that's something you see often. So that's good too. That can help you make shifts and decisions quickly, right? Yeah. What about my pre-teaching people? What are what are some very meaningful data sources to pre-teaching? We've mostly focused on um, the progress progress monitoring the data for Power Up and um, Lexia Core Five and, and Language Live. Okay. Um, but as far as but since pre-teaching it's in our classrooms for the most part um we started to look at um student samples yep. having teachers bring in the actual student samples which um i counts in that formative and summative assessments because at one of my schools that told us a lot more than like um we do the leap 360 yep. um diagnostic tests and interims yep but this we don't take it for a grade so the students don't really try as much mm -hmm. so we so we started bringing in the student samples for that and that gave us a little bit more direction on yeah. what we need to work on for pre-teaching and um but i would say the student samples has been the most powerful um and then progress monitoring of how students are regressing in the reading intervention program I love, I love the note you made. So most of these are quantitative, although some of them are qualitative, but looking at the actual student data to really see what's moving the ticker within um, is even powerful too. Thanks for that. And my little family engagement people, what do y'all consider the most powerful data sources for the family engagement? For family engagement, we were just having a sidebar over here. Um, we talked about the surveys, which we have, we have done those and the feedback forms. But in addition, we 
are also looking at student data, like those pre-assessments from our ANET, the benchmark data from the curricular resources such as EL for our uh, lower grade students, for our K-2 K students. We're looking at that benchmark data and seeing how the kids are growing from one benchmark uh, uh, session to the time frame to the other. And in addition, the dibbles. Uh, is it really making a difference in the growth of our students in those innovation schools? So all of the pieces we're basically using because we're collecting that data anyway to drive our instructional practices. And since our conversation yesterday, we have totally regrouped and we're looking at that data to see how we need to structure our pairing and engagement activities to focus on those deficits for those individual schools at those various grade bands. So that's what our uh, parent engagement activities will look like. Y'all are so responsive, Miss Antoinette and Bridget. Thank y'all so much for just really, Bridget, I love your little antennas. That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So great. Uh, y'all are really being intentional and really thinking about this um, through a lens that's really gonna make an impact on the schools and the innovations. So let's just talk very briefly about the frequency of data checks. So, um, how often should you administer these checks? And some of these are already things that exist in your school systems or in your school. But when you take it from the lens, because y'all have like two hats, some of y'all, you know, you're looking at this from a, either an RTI standpoint or a district person standpoint. So you're looking at these data anyway, but we need to have that hat as well as the innovation hat on. So are the students growing, but then also is the innovation the thing that's actually helping to make an impact too? Because we're not just looking to see if students are growing, we want students to grow, but we also, to continue funding, need to know that this innovation is actually part of the piece that's having an impact on the students. So how often should you administer these checks or look at data to determine effectiveness of the innovation specifically? Just basically often enough to make adjustments, you know? Um, looking only at beginning of year, middle of year, end of year data does not give a pulse that's frequent enough to make adjustments throughout the year. Evaluating data, po data points every week may not be realistic in your capacity as innovation coordinator. Certainly people looking at progress monitoring data are probably already doing this, so keep doing that, but it might not be real realistic for some of you that are servicing four, five, and six schools. Um, catching dips early enough to make a change and keep the progress, but consider capacity of the campus team when evaluating this data, at, you know, whenever possible. So that might be a possible area for professional learning. If you're a district personnel person and your school-based teams don't have the capacity to look at this data and make decisions based on that data, that may be uh, an entry point for you as a district person to kind of just give them some professional learning around that to determine, you know, what should, what adjustments should we make based on the data? Okay. Any questions before I keep going? All right. So just some next steps, determine who is looking at the data. So obviously you as the innovation coordinator are looking at the data, but it shouldn't be only your data. So, you know, the literacy team should definitely be looking at this data. The leadership team, if it's not the literacy team, if it's a different, you know, they have different uh, stakeholders in both, should definitely be looking at this data. If there is growth, communicate back to the stakeholders. A lot of times, um, students are not aware of what their growth looks like. Parents are not aware that their students are growing in between standardized tests. Teachers, when teachers truly see growth from something, they buy into it. Teachers want to make a difference. And so if teachers see that this innovation is really having an impact on the students, they're going to continue to invest their time and their energy into it. Um, other faculty and staff, the community, your QOZ partner should definitely be something you're communicating growth with, uh, who with, uh, and continue your course of action. If there is a decline, which can happen, that's okay. We're just, we just want to make sure when there is a decline that we're making adjustments. So bring the data through the literacy team meeting, determine the course of action, possibly a needs assessment to see where the breakdown is occurring, okay? Declines are not necessarily bad unless, you know, we don't have all the answers to everything and every population and every school with every piece of capacity. So just ensuring that you, you know, you're doing that needs assessment when you need to, to make adjustments as we go. All right, evaluate the effectiveness of your current data system. I want you to look at your current data, not like 
physically look at all the pieces of data, but consider all your data to determine if you're getting enough information, possibly too much information to make informed decisions regarding your innovation. So um, these are some questions that I kind of want you just to reflect on for a second. What is an area of strength in your data sources? Do you need more or less data to make informed decisions. Sometimes I've talked to systems and they have like four different types. We have the, we already have LEAP, that's already a given, right? We already have your um, literacy screener, that's a given. But then sometimes we have STAR and AR and benchmarks. And there's so many things that we need to make sure that when you're administering these assessments, the data, like I said, is being used for something. And there's not a other data source that's already giving you that information. Uh, is your frequency adequate? Are you are next steps being planned and executed based on that data? If you have data coming in and you're not using it to make decisions, you may not need that data or you may need to, to have a process around that set of data because maybe it is important. Where and how can you make adjustments? Um, and this may have a, a different answers for different campuses in your district even. So if you are a district level person, there might be an area of strength on one campus and it might be an area of weakness on another campus. But, you know, just take a second to kind of uh, reflect on these because we were going to breakout rooms next, but because there's only five, we'll just open the floor with who we have in here and we'll kind of discuss these. All right, guys, I feel like you get the most out of your collaboration time and less when I'm doing the talking. So I'm just going to open the floor. You don't have to go in necessarily any order, but um, I want you just to just kind of discuss any of these any of these questions or even if there's a question you have around data or you want to share a practice you feel like is really good um, helping you make decisions around your innovation, go ahead and take the time to share that now. One of the things that Bridget and I were just talking about in our district, we have what we call data roundtables. And for our innovation schools, we participate in those roundtables. But in addition to that, we also participate in our leadership uh, team meetings at our schools. And I know maybe not 100% of our principals, but the majority data is at the forefront in those data roundtable meetings. And, you know, we chime in on how we can support, uh, we def uh, find what those weaknesses are as it relates to literacy and some things that we can do to support uh, student growth in helping to close the gaps for those deficits. So that's one of the things that we do. And those, uh, the frequency of those meetings are weekly. Okay. Uh, on some campuses, some campuses, they're bi-weekly. It just depends on what the campus is. Those are definitely really strong practices to have, Ms. Antoinette. How can you tie the innovation into that too? How can you make that a part of the conversation? Okay, that data should drive what we're doing with the, our parents. One of the things we've in, in, uh, implemented, Hagerty, in all of our schools, and there is a parent component to that Hagerty, that parent letter goes home to the parents each time and it tells them what skills that they are working on. And so I was thinking um, yesterday, that would be an excellent opportunity to for some parent workshops. And we also have parent um, activity packets that we purchase that are in alignment with the various skills that kids have, in, especially in those lower grades. And we can send, do a professional development around those activity packets that match what they're doing in the Hagerty. So yeah, that conversation was good yesterday. It just started light bulbs of going off and- All the virtual high fives. That. that is yeah. so awesome. <laughs> I love that. And 
you know, secondarily, I've heard great things across the state. Anybody who has started implementing Hegarty, I've heard absolutely nothing but good things. I haven't heard one negative. The teachers review. love it. The kids yeah. love it. I hear the yeah. teachers love it. The kids love it. I hear that the data is mm -hmm. going up. So all of those are so powerful. Mm -hmm. But I love the connection yeah. that you made between that and the family literacy engagement. That would be a great mm -hmm. thing to model and do guided practice on in those parent groups. So kudos yes. to you guys. That's awesome. Yes. Anybody like let's who else? Who we got? Um, I would say as far as adjustments are concerned. Um, we were look. We've been looking at you know data um, and pulling it and things like that. But um, being able to tie it to the innovation, as you know, we, we've had to make some adjustments with getting pre teaching the way our vision is for it. And I think once we start that in the spring, um, it's going to be class inclusive. Then the then the people on our literacy teams will be able to actually see the connection of what we're looking at because we kind of I kind of get a deer in a headlights um look they look at it they analyze it but then it's like now the what? connection mm -hmm. yeah so now that that's we we did our slow we're we started our slow rollout they'll be able to tie everything that we started from Hegarty and power up and um power up in the high school language lab all of that they'll be able to tie it to the innovation directly because it'll be happening in their classroom. So that's an adjustment we made last month um, that I'm excited to see so that we can bring in that qualitative data from what I'm seeing and what they know is with their students and tie it to everything we're doing. I love that, Jordan. And guys, secondarily, y'all all each actually have different innovations, the people that are on the call right now. But if y'all wanna see Bozier is doing their innovation with all of the grade bands, K, um, K5, six, eight, and nine, 12, and they have their birth centers involved in this too. So, you know, if you want to collaborate or talk with them through any of that, um, they're, they're one of their high schools, airline high school, really showed good growth last year with that. And this is something I know that we sometimes struggle with uh, in, that, in that grade band is really making literacy part of the conversation and moving the needle there. So kudos to you guys on that. Anybody else want to share? I think we have to. I'll share a little bit real quick what we do also. Um, kind of like you guys with the, um, the parents also. When we do Erla leveling and the child levels up or whatever, we also contact the parents to let them. And we'll send next level words, next level passages for the parent. And we'll contact them to let them know what they can do to help their child at home as well. And that's a big, that's a big help because the fact that they only get so many minutes with us a day, we have to have the parent, the parental support to help. So, and we can tell, you can actually tell the difference for those kids who get that parental support at home. Absolutely, Christy. And I love how you brought that up because even though your innovation is case management, it still does not keep us from involving all these stakeholders and understanding how powerful it is when those par parents partner with us, you know, for their child. A lot of times we assume that the parents aren't involved or they don't want to do anything, but a lot of times they just don't know what don't to know do, them. right? Because they, they don't have the level of expertise that we have. So I love that y'all are engaging them um, as one of the stakeholders. It's so powerful. It's going to mean a lot to the kids too. Thanks for sharing, Christy. All right. So let's just talk briefly about resources that are happening. Um, to continue to check back for updates, the literacy library is always growing. Currently, the Lyft library is in there, The uh, constantly adding to the interventions that are there. Fire is up, unit two is available, unit three is not far behind. Um, the content literacy support documents for grades three through 12, there are five new up there, super excited about these, um, getting great feedback from the field. Um, I did a training on Lyft in upper elementary, middle and high. Um, that can be seen here, the webinar can be viewed here. And um, it just really goes through, there's four different sessions. It goes through each component of Lyft and it tells explicitly how to administer those different pieces and what can happen in the room, whether they're proficient with that piece of the diagnostic or not. And then we have a science of reading and literacy intervention um, tools for power professionals and support staff. If you have these um, stakeholders on campus and they're not really being maximized or utilized in the capacity that you would like, Sarah did a great training on this on how to kind of just involve those stakeholders as well, those paras and that support staff. And then 
for every content literacy document, there is a content literacy in action um, webinar session that shows what they look like in action and how to really do those effectively in the classroom. So constantly adding to those upcoming events. Session three of School Support Institute is back to in-person. It's that very last week of January into the first week of February, um, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. The only note is that um, my New Orleans cohort, you will now be at the Montreal Convention Center instead of the Sheraton Hotel. So just make sure you make note of that. Office hours for, the, uh, for you guys are gonna be Friday, January 6th at 11 a.m. And our next COP is currently scheduled for and will happen Friday, January 13th at 11 a.m. And we're going to be talking more about making most, making the most of your time as a literacy innovation coordinator. We've already talked about schedules for you guys. So now this one's really going to focus on how do we grow your capacity as the innovation coordinator and kind of spread the magic that is you across the district or the school or wherever it is that you're at. Okay, let's go ahead and 